All right. So we're just going to begin. Uh, welcome to this evening's program. I'm Rabbi Stephen Moskowitz, and I have the honor of leading Congregation Lador Bador here in Oyster Bay, Long Island. Not only does our synagogue provide the usual services mm -hmm. and programs, but we are especially proud of our partnership with the Institute of Politics and Global Affairs at the Brooks School of Public Policy at Cornell University. Please join us online for our many programs or in person for our services and programs. I have regrets from Representative Steve Israel who was called away to Washington DC for White House meetings on the President's Committee on the Arts and the Humanities. I know he's gonna watch a recording of this program and he sends his regards. Our guest this evening is Catherine Stewart, who is an investigative journalist and author who writes about the rise of religious nationalism, politics and policy for the New York Times op-ed, The Atlantic and many other publications. Her latest book, The Power Worshippers, Inside the Dangerous Rise of Religious Nationalism, won first place for excellence in nonfiction books from the Religious News Association. Stewart's previous book, The Good News Club, was an investigative look at efforts by the religious right to undermine public education. Alexandra Blackman will moderate the discussion and is an assistant professor in Cornell's University's Department of Government. In 2019 to 20, she was a postdoctoral associate at New York University, Abu Dhabi, Blackman's work focuses on the development of an appeal to religious identities in the political sphere, the challenges facing female politicians and political party development in the Middle East. Welcome to Catherine Stewart and Professor Blackman. We look forward to our discussion. Great, thank you so much. I'm super excited to be here and very thankful to the Institute and uh, to Rabbi Moskowitz for, for hosting us. Um, so let's jump right in. I want to ask first about, um, I want to open up some space for you to talk in general about, about your book, but ask us, start by asking a specific question of, um, related to this, the difference you see between political ideology and religious creed. So you describe Christian nationalism in power worshipers as a political ideology rather than a religious creed. And so I was hoping that for our audience tonight, you can discuss why you see Christian nationalism that way and why that distinction is important to you. Sure, thanks. That's a terrific question, Alex. And I wanna start uh, by echoing my thanks. So um, the distinction in my mind between political ideology and religion is pretty clear. Look, I mean, in a modern society, one that is as gloriously diverse as ours, it's not only possible to have a government that operates without appealing to or privileging any one religion, but I think it's necessary. So there should be no restriction whatsoever on what people want to believe or worship or practice um, in their personal lives. And there's also no limitation on how we can, um, what we can appeal to in our own minds to shape our political commitments but there is an understanding that public policy will be formed in discussions that are based on rational deliberation and the democratic process. And there should be a commitment to treat all members of uh, our diverse society equally under the law uh, without privileging one particular group over others or one sort of belief system over others, one religious belief system over others. So, um, I wanna talk about Christian nationalism more broadly. If we're gonna use the term, I'd like to sort of drill down a bit on what it is and what it's not, if that's all right with you. Yeah. Um, so uh, Christian nationalism is not Christianity. It's not a religion. It's a political phenomenon that involves the exploitation of religion for political purposes. I think of it as combining two different kinds of things. On the one hand, it's a set of ideas an ideology, and on the other hand, it's a political movement, an organized quest for power. Um, so as an ideology, it boils down to the idea 
in the American context that the United States was founded as a, a Christian nation, Christian here referring to, um, I would say, a, a conservative or reactionary conception of Christianity. As we know, Christianity in, this, in America is incredibly diverse, but um, the, the Christianity of Christian nationalism is really sort of one view of what Christianity is or uh, several approved views. And um, they take the those who subscribe to this ideology, take it that all of our problems stem from the fact that we have somehow forsaken the supposed heritage of that founding. Now, this ideology is a tool, a really useful tool for a political machine that turns this story into political power. That's the sort of movement part of it. And that machinery is, um, let's say it's leadership driven and also organization driven. I really describe the inner workings of that um, machinery in my book, The Power Worshippers. And it can, there are different, um, let's say organizations that we can group into categories or right-wing legal advocacy groups. There are policy groups, there are pastoral organizations, networking organizations like legislative and even data initiatives, all the features of modern political campaigns. And what they do uh, in election cycles is get large numbers of people to vote out for, you know, for the political candidates that the movement favors who are gonna do what movement leaders want them to do. And, um, and you know, they really want to enshrine the policies that they want in our laws and our society. So um, thank you for that. I want to I want to sort of stay on this topic of political ideology and political movement and turn to um, one of the, the sort of more alarming statements that arises in the introduction of the book, uh, where you state that one party is now beholden to a movement that does not appear to have much respect for representative democracy. I want I want to uh, ask you to unpack that a bit more. Um, in what ways does the ideology of Christian nationalism stand in opposition to the conception of representative democracy that we've long espoused in the United States? And I think this is important. I want to just add a little bit here um, because part of that is that the ideology, uh, there's some tension there with representative democracy that is that is emerging from this movement. And yet in a lot of the book, you're talking about them as a political movement and political movements in the United States almost necessarily have to use the tools of democracy in order to in order to spread their message and in order to gain power. So I'm I'm interested in understanding more about this position that they have and how that affects also their practice. Sure. Um, there's a lot to unpack here. Um, I think we should start with the fact that um, the leading figures in the Republican Party are campaigning now against democracy. We had a coup attempt and the Republican Party decided to side with the plotters. The system of justice has now indicted many of the people behind the plot, including the former president. Uh, what is it, 91 charges ac across, uh, facing 91 uh, charges uh, across four criminal cases. And he remains the current GOP favorite for 2024 and other um, uh, candidates for the Republican nomination have said that they will pardon him. Uh, the Republican Party uh, leaders say that the bad guys are the system of justice and, um, uh, and, and that the good guys are actually the insurrectionists and those who supported them, those who supported those who um, uh, staged that disgraceful attack in our capital. And we also know that many of the leaders of the Christian nationalist movement, the leaders of many of the key organizations were the ones spreading election lies. Um, I've detailed this extensively in my writing and my journalism, and as well as my book. They spread these lies at pastor conferences before the insurrection where you had people who were speaking in front of like gatherings of dozens of pastors and doing like you know, dozens of these uh, meetings across the country to sort of turn out the pastors. And they would feature people like Hogan Gidley, who was a former member of the Trump administration. He was there billed as an election integrity specialist. And he told all these pastors that dead people voted and these are repeated lies that had already been debunked about our allegations uh, of voting irregularities in places like um, Arizona that had already been debunked. Um, you had 
pastoral leaders and heads of uh, key organizations of the religious right, like Charlie Kirk or uh, Rob McCoy, spreading election denies or election denial. Um, uh, you had, uh, you know, in, in multi, you had groups like the Council for National Policy. This is one of the movement's leading networking organizations. It brings together um, the sort of doers and the donors of the organizations, the sort of funders of various initiatives and heads of different organizations. And they called on um, people on their side to contest the electoral votes from the states that were the subject of Trump's baseless allegations. They did this, you know, week before the insurrection. So there's nothing uh, merely apparent about the anti-democratic position of the movement. And that movement, frankly, has essentially taken over the Republican Party. And it really fits within an anti-democratic pattern that we've already seen uh, that includes voter suppression, often race-based gerrymander, gerrymandering, um, stacking the courts uh, through unfair means. We all remember Merrick Garland, uh, uh, former President Obama, uh, Obama was not allowed in his final year as a president to actually um, you know, bring forth a Supreme Court uh, justice. Uh, and it's all a means of entrenching minority rule. And all of that is frankly consistent, unfortunately, with um, seizure of power by other means, if and when those other mechanisms don't succeed. So, um, you know, that's sort of a lot to take in, but this is a movement that has been um, anti-democratic from the start. Um, it doesn't believe in the principles of equality and pluralism that represent the best of the American promise. And yes, for many years, the, the movement used the tools of democracy to dismantle democracy. Look, there's nothing against anyone turning out the vote. And, um, but, but it's really turned a corner now with the sort of embrace of election lies and these other, frankly, um, anti-democratic means. So building on that, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, one historic aspect of, of the, the ideology and, and again, the connection to ideas about inequality. And um, in several chapters of the book, you talk about the intersection between Christian nationalism and race. And this is a big theme uh, in the power worshipers. You know, on the one hand, you you talk about the segregationist views that play a role in mobilizing the movement. And on the other hand, you also have um, a chapter that's focusing on the mobilization of non-white evangelicals into the movement today. And, you know, embedded in the discussion of these segregationist views, obviously, you know, self-evidently is a belief about the inequality, uh, you know, inequality of people of different racial backgrounds. So I, I wanted... Um, to hear more from you about, you know, what you view as as the relationship between Christian nationalism and race, and also the the types of ideas about equality and inequality that are embedded in the ideas of this movement. Sure, um, that's a great question, and it's a pretty complex picture. But I think we can start by saying that racism is woven into the origins of the religious right in very deep ways. Um, leaders of the most of the major religious denominations in the time of slavery um, either supported slavery actively um, or had uh, actually kind of made their peace with it. Frederick Douglass said that the American church was quote, the bulwark of slavery. And of course there were um, a number of uh, religious leaders who I discuss in the power worshipers, perhaps I uh, mentioned a dozen of them who drew their opposition or justified their opposition to slavery in uh, in the scripture, but they tended to be, as uh, Douglas said, uh, arguing from, quote, humble pulpits. And he said, uh, you know, Frederick Douglas said it was the $5,000 divines, that $5,000 was a lot of money at that time. It was like very well-resourced uh, pastors and ministers who he said were, you know, on the side of the slaveholder. Um, Moving and and many of them said that you know segregation was um, actually you know God's established order, and then during of course the Jim Crow era and immediately after, major religious figures like Jerry Falwell and Bob Jones either said 
segregation was scriptural or again, you know, God's established order or strongly hinted at their um, agreement with it. But things have really shifted uh, since that time. Over the past decade, and, um, you know, just, you know, to finish out this thought, um, movement leaders, of course, are, are dri driving support for politicians who have made um, race-based voter suppression and gerrymandering a kind of part of their um, strategy for winning elections. But over the past decade, things have shifted quite a bit. I think movement leaders can see the demographic future as clearly as you or I can, and they recognize that the movement's really not going to survive it if they just stick to a kind of an all-white uh, rank and file. Um, and they've also seen opportunity in a lot of conservative-leaning um, communities of color, and they've reached out very actively to pastors at um, many of these conservative-leaning churches in order to draw them in and get their congregations active um, politically and to get them to vote the right way. They've had uh, quite a lot of success in particular with Latino pastors in Pentecostal and neo-charismatic churches. And we can see the results in our politics between 2016 and 2020, the Latino vote overall shifted between eight and 10 points um, in favor of uh, Republicans which is a pretty dramatic shift over time. Um, at some of the right-wing conferences I attend, about a third of the presenters, I'm thinking about you know, off the hand, Road to Majority, it's an annual gathering of key activists and strategists and politicians put together by Ralph Reed, who's this very sort of seasoned and astute religious right leader. About a third of the presenters at his conferences in the past few years have been um, uh, people of color, and large numbers of faith leaders and political activists of color are in attendance. Um, I've also been to gatherings for, you know, organized specifically for Latino pastors. I described one in Power Worshippers where I was at a mega church in Chula Vista, California, where there's this 400 people in this sanctuary, the gathering, you know, the, a series of speakers were giving presentations in Spanish or in English with Spanish translators and really trying to get these pastors to understand that, you know, they need to get their congregations to vote their so-called biblical values. And when they talk about biblical values, it always boils down to sort of right-wing positions in the culture wars. Religious right leaders know very well, if you can get the pastors, you can get a large number of their congregants because pastors are very trusted by congregants. And they know if you can also get people to vote on one or two or three issues, you can control their votes. So if you get people to vote on abortion and say it's the most important um, uh, biblical issue of our time, well, then you can move a large number of votes in that way. Yeah, I think this is, um, yeah, this this sort of tension between the, the initial racial politics of this movement and some of the moves that they're making today, I think is really uh, is really important and interesting. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, where you end, I think, in the book, and I guess it's also in the introduction, but thinking about the international dimensions of this, you know, this isn't a phenomenon that is um, restricted to the United States. And so um, I want to hear a little bit more about, you know, who these groups are at the international level and how they're networked. And and also hear from you, like, what are the connections that these groups have? So are they, what do they share? Is it that they share uh, these conservative values? Is it that they share these anti-democratic positions? If we're thinking about the Viktor Orban, um, you know, the people that support Viktor Orban in Hungary. So um, yeah, I want to, I want to invite you to talk a little bit about, you know, what happens outside of the United States and how the, the movement in the United States is connected to those those larger trends. Wow. Okay, that's there's a lot here as well, and great question from you because I know you uh, have done such marvelous study of these issues in other regions. And um, first thing I want to say is that you know sometimes religious national like there's nothing remarkable about religious nationalism in America. I think it's easier to see 
from within America when you see it happen in other countries. So when you have a leader like Viktor Orban in Hungary or Vladimir Putin in Russia or Erdogan in Turkey, um, when these leaders are, um, are binding themselves very tightly to conservative religious figures in their own countries in order to consolidate a more authoritarian form of political power, we rightly recognize that as religious nationalism. And often what they're doing is bubble wrapping themselves in the sanctimony to prevent any democratic check on their power, investigation into their corruption, and investigation into abuses that may be perpetrating uh, against their own people. So um, in the last chapter of Power Worshippers, I talk about how some of the leaders in the, in the United States, some of the religious right leaders, the leaders of different factions of the Christian nationalist movement are working with leaders in other countries. Um, many of the organizations in America, such as um, the International Organization of the Family or the Alliance Defending Freedom, which is a, a leading um, uh, legal advocacy group with, you know, they're, they're, it's very international. They have um, offices in, uh, in maybe six or seven offices in different parts of the world, different countries. Um, groups like the Leadership Institute, which plays a really um, strong role in training uh, a lot of leaders are, are also very transnational. So you've got money that's flowing from U.S. individuals and organizations, but you also have money flowing from places like Russia and other states um, and, and various private donors. You know, the, the money goes from one place to another. And while there are nuances specific to different countries, and you can't, again, like say the picture in America looks just like the picture in, an, in X country, the war on liberal democracy is global. You have, you know, so I went to this, gathering of the World Congress of Families in Verona. And I talked about some of the leaders of these different organizations and, um, and, and leading figures who were talking about, you know, make liberal, you know, democratic politicians fear you. This is like what one of the speakers said. Um, and, uh, you know, they talk about globalism by which they, they mean a lot when they use the term globalism. But part of what they're talking about is like a sort of an attack on liberalism. And they say, we, we meaning they, you know, in this movement are as global as globalism itself. And they're right about that. So, um, you know, they, I think we can sort of, you, you asked about their ideology and, and their core values. And I think we can summarize and, you know, summarize it by calling it reaction. Um, I think sometimes when we talk about, you know, what they have in common, we, we tend to use their language and we assert that their take on their own values is fact. And we really shouldn't be so um, two dimensional about it. They'll say they believe in family, the Bible, tradition, and things like that. But if you take a more clinical look and you really try to offer synthesis based on what you see, I think the values often look um, they're a little bit different. So I think for them being good means conforming, uh, being obedient, and that tends to translate into, you know, translate into support for um, gender order, uh, for existing orders of rank. Um, but along with that comes, you know, this kind of nihilistic um, desire to destroy people who, um, who refuse to conform, you know. Um, so, um, I don't know, put it another way, Conformity, conformity can be just another value. So they're, they, they really want everyone to kind of just get in line. And that's one of the reasons they're so sort of incensed by, you know, feminism, you know, uh, gay people and things like that. They just see that as a, a complete violation of the, the order that they, that, they, that they want. And they see um, a destruction of that order, any deviation of that order, I should say as um, anything, you know, as inviting chaos and as being deeply, deeply threatening to them. Yeah, I like that. I like that term conformity. I'm realizing the lighting in my in my room. I, I didn't realize how dark it was going to get. So I might step away to just turn the light switch on. But um, I wanted to ask Rabbi Moskowitz, should we open it up to questions at this point? Should we um, I can I have more questions prepared, but I, I see that there are some in the chat. So I just don't know what um, what the norms are. That's 
I mean, you're the moderator. So if you want to take these two questions in the chat, I think with, with 200 plus people, you know, we can't, we're going to, either people are going to have to kind of raise their hand and use that Zoom, the, that Zoom feature, or you can take questions from the chat if you want at different times in the, in the program. All right. Well, now we're getting a lot of questions in the chat. So let me just, um, yes, let me, so that's your call. Yeah, let me ask you one more of my questions. And then while you're answering that, I'll I'll take a look through the chat and see how we can summarize some of them um, so we can we can see what we have there. Um, I want to transition a little bit, you know, one of the things um that I heard about you before before this event was that you had recently written an article about the Claremont Institute, which um was shared with me. And I think one of the things that really struck me reading Power Worshippers and also reading that article about the Claremont Institute um, was this idea that there's a lot of focus on in both of these movements on things like sexual order, on this idea of fighting for salvation against forces of darkness. You see this both in the sort of fight against nihilism that you talk about in the Claremont Institute um, and also in these religious movements. So I, I wanna um, just ask you how these two movements are related. So how are the, the, the political activists and the, and the, the leaders that you describe in power worship, power worshipers related to this, you know, this other aspect or dimension of, um, of the right-wing politics in the country, which are mobilized around the Claremont Institute and around that Institute's politics? Thanks. That's a great question. So just for anybody who's not familiar with the Claremont Institute, it's a think tank that came together in the 1970s when some graduate students in California were inspired by the political philosopher Harry Jaffa and some other ideas. And the think tank um, originally saw its mission as you know, bolstering democracy and America's founding principles. Um, it's always been conservative, but it has become more and more and I would say in, in, in its origins, maybe a little more traditional conservative, but it's become more and more reactionary over the years. So it's a think tank. It runs a couple of journals, has a fellowship program that brings in a lot of people, and it uh, tries to and has succeeded very much so in inserting itself in the political process on the Republican side. So, um, so much to say here. I mean, Claremont is one of the main purveyors of a kind of... Um, gosh, authoritarian ideology. And this ideology is driving much of the politics in the Republican Party today. So when you hear somebody talk about woke, and then you hear them to describe as um, sort of wokeness, you know, however they, you know, do or don't describe it as a form of tyranny or a national emergency, like the idea that there might be a diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, uh, division in some corporate headquarters or in some uh, university, they call this a national emergency, like the main threat to our country. And, um, you know, that's that's where Claremont has been very successful in sort of um, framing that uh, as, a, as an agenda for the Republican Party. Um, when you hear people talk about how institutions of culture have all been captured by a a leftist revolutionary communist elite. <laughs> um, these are all ideas, fictions really, that are manufactured by Claremont Institute and they're used to justify an essentially authoritarian response. Um, so Claremont Institute is basically whispering in the ears of political leaders like Ron DeSantis and Trump and Vivek Ramaswamy. Um, and they're, you know, you hear these guys talk about, you know, the, you know, uh, administrative state. This is something that the Claremont Institute has decided needs to be completely torn down. Um, it's 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 frankly a very nihilistic um, view of the world. Um, they think that, you know, somehow um, the fact that America is sort of embracing equality and pluralism, they see this as tyranny. So, um the idea is just sort of tear it all down, tear down the administrative state. Now, they're not really clear on what it would look like the morning after. I mean, who's going to do our sort of food safety? Who's going to do our air traffic control? Is, you know, there are, um, 
you know, who's going to do our national security, but they're, um, you know, it's almost like a kind of um, a nihilism. And, you know, it's a, a deeply misogynist organization. They're not doing anything to hide their misogyny. Um, and it plays out in different ways among the different um, activists at Claremont. Um, but it plays to the resentments and insecurities and fantasies of power uh, among certain reactionary folks. So, um, you know, the misogyny appeals to people who feel that gender norms are under threat, and that is somehow like an existential crisis. Um, they think the modern world is full of terrors and, um, and so on. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And I think the sort of parallels with the religious movement that you're describing in power worshipers is is fascinating. I want to um, return to some of the questions in the chat now that I've had a chance to, to look through them. So I want to start with um, Henry Robinson. Um, he's asking a question about, uh, I'll just read the question, I guess, is the best way to do this. So uh, you define religious nationalism as a tool to gain political power. To what extent is religious nationalism compatible or not compatible with democracy? Can the First Amendment, which protects the free exercise of religion, make a meaningful distinction between the exercise of a religion that seeks political power and the exercise of religion that does not seek political power? And I just want to add a, a question that comes from another um, another one of our um, participants at the same time, which is right below it. Um, which is, is, again, getting to this idea about, you know, the compatibility of religion and religious movements with democracy. And this person asks, if people aren't encouraged to vote, to vote based on their moral beliefs, what are they supposed to be basing their votes on? Isn't it fundamentally democratic to vote based on your moral beliefs? Um, so I think this is sort of the flip side of it. So this person is arguing that there, there seems to be like, religious movements would be very compatible with democracy. So I wanna I wanna open those questions up to you and, and ask how you see this relationship between um, democracy and religious nationalism overall. Wow, it's a lot of questions. I can really only do one at a time. So I'm gonna take the last one. Yeah. Um, religious movements and religion is absolutely compatible with democracy. Religious freedom is one of the most um, you know, cherished values uh, in our in our democracy uh, through freedom to worship uh, and believe as we choose. Uh, but religious freedom um, also believes that um, you know we don't have to worship any god or sacred idea um, if we don't want to, and we should be free to not be compelled to support any particular religion with our tax dollars if we don't want to. So we have two uh, religion clauses in the First Amendment, the Establishment Clause, which comes first, um, which is um, uh, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, nor prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And there's a kind of tension between those two clauses. I think that uh, tension is deliberate. Um, but these clauses have the best piece of real estate in our constitution this idea of religious freedom, but the idea that we should not be compelled to worship if we don't want to or support a religion if we don't want to. And if you look at the writings of founders, very clearly we look at um, you know, the letter to Danbury Baptist that came from Thomas Jefferson's pen. Um, and he was the one who sort of enshrined this idea of a wall of separation between church and state. And this um, principle has been applied imperfectly over time there have always been um it's always been a kind of uh work in progress in, in many regards but um religious nationalism is something else it's not a religious movement it's a political movement and i think when you're talking about i think it really helps when we're trying to understand this movement to distinguish between the rank and file and the leaders of the movement so when you're talking about the rank and file talking about a really large number of people with very diverse interests and agendas, ideas, backgrounds. So when they cast their vote, um, say to uh, defend the traditional family or to end abortion, a lot of them aren't making major, you know, like an, they're not arguing for major changes in the way our government is run. They're really, you know, it's 
making a statement about them, you know, what they value in themselves. And so, you know, you might say that they're, you know, sometimes they might maybe lending support to a religious nationalist agenda with their vote, but you wouldn't call them religious nationalists themselves. But the leaders of the movement, um, it's a whole different story. They want three things. They want power and um, uh, political access, access to not only private money, but also public money. And they want policies that privilege a cer certain set of approved beliefs over others, and certainly um, policies that approve um, religious belief over um, people who don't happen to identify as religious. So um, I hope that helps uh, answer this question. Yeah, I think that that actually answers, I think, for me, at least all of those questions. Um, there's There are a few questions uh, that are getting at things that are happening in the future. So I want to pose one of those to you. Um, one of the questions in the chat is, what happens to the movement if Trump loses in, in 2024? What should we expect of this, this Christian nationalist movement at that point? Well, I can't see into the future, but I will tell you something I did just a couple of weeks ago. I don't know how many of you guys have heard of the Reawaken America tour. It's a um, it was an organization founded in 2021 by Mike Flynn, who, um, as you all know, is like former, you know, is a very close associate of Trump. Roger Stone is involved. Um, usually one of the Trump sons shows up to speak at these gatherings. They draw thousands of people. They're usually held in mega churches or occasionally on public lands when they can get the permitting. Um, and it's like a conspiracy fest. You walk in there, you see, man, I wish I could like share with you like the, just even a picture of the t-shirts that are collected there. You've got QAnon conspiracists. You've got great replacement conspiracists. You've got a lot of COVID conspiracists. You've got stuff, people talking about one world government. You, you know, you've got people talking about how the vaccine is designed to kill 80% of Americans and bring in, you know, others, you know, uh, undeserving, you know, um, you know, aliens or, or the like. Um, uh, I mean, it's just, you know, at the, at the, uh, Reawaken America stop in Las Vegas, Alex Jones, you guys know who he is. He's like, I mean, he has just made all of his money and reputation off one grotesque conspiracy after another, including conspiracies involving uh, dead children, murdered children. But the one, so not everybody there, I would say, believes in every single conspiracy that's articulated from the stage. And there are a lot of different art, um, conspiracies articulated. But the one conspiracy that unites them, and this message is repeated over and over and over, is the election was stolen. Trump is the rightful president. They're going to steal the next one. We're not going to let it happen. And um, this means war, um, the kind of bloodthirsty language that gets articulated in these settings is genuinely, genuinely alarming. Uh, and look, we know there are a lot of militia members involved in the organizing in January 6th, three percenters and the Proud Boys and things like that. Um, people who follow the growth of uh, militia movements um, say that there has been um, an extraordinary explosion of this type of activity. This goes back a little bit to something we were talking about earlier, the Claremont Institute. In one of their publications, they published a lengthy excerpt of a book by a fellow named Kevin Slack, who is a professor at Hillsdale College. And I'm sort of paraphrasing here because I don't have the you know language in front of me, but he said, it is time for Republican, Republican, um, with the Republican establishment to ally themselves with the AR-15 crowd. And then he described how men should be getting together with other men and forming militias and, um, you know, practicing their weaponry and doing things like that. And other people who have been um, included in the, you know, um, Claremont Institute podcasts and, and discussions have also talked about, you know, in the coming collapse of civilization, which they want, which they seem to want, 
um, you know, I want to be a warlord and, and how great, how glorious this is going to be. I mean, it's it's really shocking. We're hearing this is grotesquely anti-democratic um, uh, stuff that we're hearing. And anybody who thinks that kind of um, traveling roadshow where they're doing dozens of events, drawing in thousands of Trump's most devoted supporters, spreading these lies and conspiracies, you think that's not going to have an effect on our democracy, you're absolutely wrong. The, the whole point of spreading disinformation is if you can separate people from the facts, it makes them easier to control. They'll believe anything you tell them, right? Because they've been separated from reality and, uh, and you can get them to do things that, that you want them to do. And um, and so disinformation and and sort of the, the cultivation of resentment and then the channeling of that resentment into the sort of belief in these conspiracies is is a, is a one of the main features of the movement. It's one of the main features of how it works. So this goes back to your question: What can we expect if Trump loses? I mean, wasn't it Mike Huckabee who said on I think it was like um, Trinity Broadcasting, it's a Christian broadcasting network, a large one, said the other day, if if you don't allow Trump to run and win, this is the last. Again, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, but look it up. He said, it's very close. He said, this is the last election that will be fought with ballots and not bullets. They're, so this, they're really appeal, like using the rhetoric of political violence. This is not a joke. This is really not a joke. So I do th think that our, our democracy is at a crisis point and it's really time for us to sort of step up and do our part, try to defend it. Yeah, I think... I mean, I think that's a very clear message, uh, clear message in the books. And I want to just interject uh, one of my own questions here again, um, which is given the sort of dire picture that you paint of the situation with democracy and the, these attitudes and this mobilization against democracy among um, this Christian nationalist movement, are there are there any reasons for optimism? You know, are there any trends that you see as positive? Um, whether they're responding to this movement or even trends from within the movement trying to sort of pull back a little bit on this this more radical position. You know, I see um, a sort of doubling down on a lot of the uh, uh, rhetoric of violence, but I do see causes for optimism in a few places. So first of all, there are more people in America who support democracy who support the principles of equality and justice and pluralism than there are who don't. And I think the reason the movement has so much power is because they have managed to turn out the vote in disproportionate numbers and also to, you know, through gerrymandering, voter suppression, sort of game elections in a lot of ways. Um, but I do think that there are more of, of those who, you know, support democracy um, and, you know, really need a big tent, you know, from... There's a lot of conservatives who who support democracy and and see the the current turn toward political violence and um, criminality as as disgraceful, and um, I think if we can you know you know if you if you if you see someone they agree with you on like eighty percent but twenty percent they then you're not in agreement well that's fine that's an eighty percent friend I mean I think that we need to stop looking for perfection and really look for um, you know, to make alliances with with those who, you know, agree with us in the main. I think there's a lot of reporting on polling and approval ratings, but I do think that there are also signs, for example, um, uh, like we can look to the Democrats overperformance in a lot of local elections or or sometimes even, you know, moderate Republicans overperformance in, in local elections. And I think that those are um, signs of um, optimism. Also, you know, if we look at the state level, we often obsess about places like Florida and how DeSantis is turning the state toward authoritarianism. But then in states like Michigan and Minnesota, you see um, the direction moving in more um, progressive and uh, a more progressive direction. So I think that, um, you know, I, I tend to not be optimistic or pessimistic. Um, I'm just, I feel like the time is now for sort of determination, um, as Stacey Abrams said. But the first step in the struggle, of course, is for us to open our eyes and ears um, 
but that's not enough. We really need to engage in the political process in meaningful ways, not just in symbolic ones. It's not enough to just sort of tweet or maybe join a demonstration. It's really about engaging often on the, on the local level. This is something the religious right is really good at doing, activating people on the local level getting people involved in school board elections. Well, if their Moms for Liberty candidates are the only ones showing up, guess what? <laughs> you know, They're just gonna dominate those local elections and those local uh, functions. So we need to you know, do what we can as individuals. Um, also, I think figure out our lane uh, and figure out how we can do even more than before by joining together with others on democracy building initiatives. Um, not just voting, but also bring others to vote, defending voting rights, supporting candidates for political office up and down the ballot, getting involved in um, uh, various democracy, democracy building initiatives. I mean, there's um, no shortage of avenues for engagement. Yeah, I think that that's all really great. Um, there are a few questions here about education, which I wanna, I wanna just ask one of them. Um, I think this, this is a theme you pick up in the power worshipers when you talk about the origin story of this religious right movement and their concern over desegregation of schools. So clearly there's a connection here to education institutions that I think is important. So one of the participants asks the question, to what extent does a seemingly secular appeal for parents' rights to regulate instruction in books in public schools and libraries serve as a dog whistle for the agenda of Christian nationalism? Well, it sounds like you're um, referring to something very specific. So like, of course, parents have rights. No, I mean, children also have rights. They have a right to a meaningful education, um, to, uh, you know, an upbringing free from coercion and abuse. And, um, and of course, a right to a chance to, you know, um, find a way to contribute to the world. Um, but when uh, some of the movement activists appeal to parents' rights, they're drawing on theories by people like, um, I would say, Michael Ferris, who's the, he um, was a former head of the um, HS, uh, the Homeschooling Legal Defense um, uh, Alliance. It's like a sort of right-wing homeschooling organization that advocate, when they were advocating for parents' rights, they were advocating for absolute rights of parents over children. Um, Look, I'm not anti-homeschooling. I actually homeschooled one of our children for a time and uh, it was really enjoyable and interesting and absolutely right for him at that time. Um, fun thing I'll, I'll never do again. <laughs> but the thing is, we have this patchwork of regulation in all these different states. And in some states where these sort of homeschooling parents' right absolutists have been most... Um, um, I would say belligerent, and I use the word belligerent deliberately because they harass law, uh, state policymakers that try to like institute the most basic regulations. You don't even have to tell anybody you're homeschooling your kids. You don't have any checks. There's no, um, there's no way to make sure that you're actually teaching your kids anything. There's no requirement that they go to a doctor once a year to make sure they're not getting abused. I mean, there have been these horrific cases where people just and this isn't the majority, of course, but some of the legislation has been institute, introduced into states where there have been these horrible cases where parents are not sending their kids to school, not educating their kids and actually like um, abusing them. And so state lawmakers see this and they're like, we need to have some kind of basic, you know, like an annual checkup with a doctor or, you know, give us some kind of basic plan for what you, you know, what you're going to teach your kids. And as a mom who homeschooled, that was actually really, those regulations were hugely helpful to me. So I was like, oh gosh, I got to think about this. How are we going to do science? What texts are we going to use? Like that stuff was actually useful and fun. But um, like these sort of parents' rights absolutists want to eliminate all of that kind of stuff that actually is intended to protect children. Um, so I, I, I don't know if that helps, but sort of... Um, you know, of course, parents have rights again, but different, you know, this is a cohort that means something different when they're talking about parents' rights. Yeah, I think that's that's really helpful. Um, I, I want to say just one last thing about that. I mean, I, of course, you know, I'm a mom of two kids and I think 
um, materials in school should absolutely be age appropriate. But, you know, this is a movement that's trying, you know, they say, oh, we want, we don't want indoctrination. And yet these are the same groups whose leaders are trying to insert their religious programming into public schools. And also they they hate public education. They they call public schools government schools. They um they're trying doing everything they can to weaken public schools rather than strengthen them by siphoning off money and directing it toward um religiously or ideologically based charter schools. And even they want, you know, uh, public money to to fund uh, religious schools directly. So when you hear these sort of supposedly secular appeals, you gotta figure out who they're coming from and then take a, a step back, look at who's sort of, who's funding that organization, who supports it and what do the leaders really say when they're talking amongst themselves? Yeah, um, yeah, and I think that that is uh, very helpful. And I think it does answer this, this question about what parents' rights could potentially mean in certain cases, like, you know, the, the activists that are behind some of these, um, some of these parents' rights groups. Um, there's a question in the chat that I think is, is an important one to, to ask about this religious, um, this Christian nationalism, which has to do with the role that other denominations play in it. So there's an emphasis here, obviously, on uh, evangelical movements. And the question here is about Catholic bishops. So what is the role of the Catholic Church um, in interacting with the Christian nationalist movement, supporting it, opposing it? What are the roles of, of sort of other denominations in, in, this, um, in this political ideology? The movement is often described as evangelical, but it is not synonymous for evangelicalism by any means. The movement draws in many evangelicals, but it excludes many evangelicals too. Christianity in America is incredibly diverse. Evangelicalism is very diverse. There are a lot of evangelical initiatives like um, the Baptist Joint Committee, Christians Against Christian Nationalism, so many other initiatives that are actually opposed to Christian nationalism and say, not in our name, uh, this does not accord with our faith. The movement also draws in representatives of both Protestant and non-Protestant forms of religion. And some people who lend support to the movement are not even Christian at all. Um, so I'll just give you some examples, like the movement um, would be nowhere, the, the leadership would, would be nowhere without a cohort of um, sort of very active reactionary Catholics. Look at the judiciary, look at organizations like the Federalist Society, which has played a really strong role in uh, grooming and promoting candidates for the courts. Um, uh, they... Um, you know, they there there's a lot of sort of say sort of plutocratic Catholic money that supports some of those organizations that are adjacent to that organization. Look at this fellow Barry uh, Bar Barry Side. He's a Chicago billionaire. He donated 1.6 billion dollars to um, you know devoted that to right wing causes, and he put Leonard Leo, the, the head of the Federal Society, in charge of that. Barry Side is Jewish. And then there are people who seem to have pledged to no creed more than that of money. I think about the Kochs, who um, may not themselves be um, particularly uh, religious more than in a nominal way, but they are also funding a lot of these right-wing think tanks that work very closely with religious nationalist initiatives and, and uh, work sort of hand in glove with those. Or I think about someone like Peter Thiel, who um, identified uh, until recently as an atheist and yet is involved in sustaining some of the um, politicians who are working hand in glove with religious nationalist leaders. So this is, um, you know, I think of it sometimes like there are the funders, right? You got the, you know, often very deep pocketed funders who have their own agenda, often having much more to do with right-wing um, economic positions than positions in the culture wars. You know, they want low taxes or no taxes for the rich. They want no regulation for their businesses. They're in support of the sort of accumulation of plutocratic wealth. But how are you gonna get the little people, the rank and file to vote for those economic policies that are making it so much harder for their families to succeed? Well, you get them on the culture wars. 
culture wars are like these shiny baubles. They dangle. If you get people to vote on abortion and, oh, like there's, you know, some, you know, same sex marriage over there. Look at that. And then all of a sudden you get people voting for policies that don't help them. So, I mean, here's the irony about this movement. They claim to stand for family values. They claim to stand for the family. And yet they're driving support for these politicians whose policies are making it so much harder for American families to succeed. Yeah. Um, I want to be mindful of the time. And I want so I want to ask what I think is a, a really open-ended question that came up in the chat, but is a really good way of, of, of wrapping up and giving you the final word, which is how do you envision the end game? <laughs> so I'll let you, I'll let you uh take that as you would like to, but um I want to open up the floor to the end game. Well, I I don't uh, predict the future. It's just I just never do that. Um, but I'll tell you uh, what gives me hope is you guys give me hope. Uh, everybody listening in tonight, I think that um, you know I see such a, a shift in how in the awareness of this movement and the it's uh, and and the dangers of of losing our democracy and. Um, and not just a shift in awareness, but also a determination to do something. So, um, you know, I take a lot of um, hope also from, I take, you know, I see as examples, people who have faced so many, you know, much worse in the past, people who have faced genocides, people who have uh, faced enslavement and who, and who fought for freedom or fought to end these genocides, even though they would sort of never see the results for themselves. They, they fought for their children or their grandchildren or even for people, maybe even they knew they wouldn't have anyone in their own family survive them, but they fought for, for, for people in the future. They, they fought for a better future for people they couldn't, they, they knew they'd never meet. And I, I just think that, um, you know, they, they are my inspiration and, and you guys are my inspiration. So I want to thank you so much for joining in tonight for this conversation. Yeah, this was this was really wonderful. I want to turn it back over to um, Rabbi Moskowitz to, I don't know, close us out. Again, I this is my first time moderating, so I'm not sure what the norms are, but. The only norm is I just want to offer a thank you both uh, to you, Alex Blackman, for moderating and to Catherine Stewart for your insights uh, on, on everything that's going on. I know we all learned a great deal, and I thank you for joining us. Uh, we are we are really grateful for your your wisdom and uh, all of your both of your scholarship. So thank you again for joining us, everyone. I hope to see you soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.